Okay, we are now live, so people will start joining us. Okay. And uh, I won't tell you how many people come or not, because it'll just make you nervous. Yeah, you can always tell me that another time. Okay, I will tell you the French guy today, as incredible as he was, he had two people. I felt so bad. <laughs> Such a nice guy. Um, let me also make sure, oh, yeah, this is recording, and we're good. Okay. Let me put this other thing up. Uh, I can put that up after. Okay. So um, what will happen is people start joining. I'll just say hi and welcome them and whatever. And then, um, but you know what? A lot of people are having, like a lot of people sign up for these, but then don't come to them live because they know that they can watch them later. Right. right yeah. You know, and fr Friday night, I honestly don't expect a big audience right. because yeah. it's, um, you know, not what I want to do on Friday night. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. I know. But that's why I threw in a lot of stuff that wasn't just for the U.S. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people from other countries will watch it. Yeah. You may want to. We got know. no. We got one question on that. Oh. Yeah. Maybe oh you yeah. You do have one. You have one international question. Yeah. yeah. You may want to mention that you know we we do cover stuff in there about your dealing with your doctors, mm -hmm. um, getting better support. Right. That have to do with pretty much the world, not just the United States. Oh yeah. No, definitely. And that's, that's the thing. What's good about this is that people can watch it afterwards, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and really get back into like watching it in their own time. And when they want, I, I have uh, probably about 20 video, you know, on, on, when you open up all these tabs yes. on, on your, t I have about 20 tabs open of different kinds of videos, um, mostly social work kind of videos that I get an email, it has a video contained in it. I open the, the video because I know if I just keep it in the email, I'll never remember to watch it. So I have all these tabs across my thing of videos and things that I wanna watch. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm done, when I'm not working, I'm like, oh, I'm too tired. I don't wanna watch right. it now. I can't concentrate. No. So, uh, wait, I gotta take this call. This Suzanne, I hope nothing's going wrong. Hi, everything okay? Oh, the bike. Oh, the bike. That's okay. Shows you exercise. Right. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi, Josephine. How are you? I'm good. Great, great summit, right? Things are going good. Things are going very good. I'm really happy. Yep, yep. One more day. It's been a marathon. It's been uh, a marathon. Yeah, I know. It's been a long one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's been very good. We had great attendance, great questions. So, yeah, do you guys get to take some time off after this? Uh, no, because <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have a scientific meeting coming up oh, in, oh. that we're doing virtually, and all of a sudden, I have like another 30 recordings. <laughs> so, what, jo, just I'm like, jo. I'm like saying, I'm out, uh, more recordings. Susan, you do recordings and Bruno Yeah, I like them. I got recording. another one today. Oh, did you? Yes, yeah. yeah. So I, I think Bruno has six and I have two. So we have eight all together. How many are, how many total are there? Thirty? They're about thirty, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, uh, so, 30. Yeah, they gotta get their act together in the next week. <laughs> Docs are notorious for like today's a deadline for abstracts. Oh, I mean, yeah. today is when you get the abstracts, like right before midnight. Everybody just starts sending them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's cra it's crazy. That's how they do things yeah. on the day of the deadline. That's it. So, um, Josephine, you don't look like Helene. I was supposed to have Helene on here. Did you get this? Incentive? No, I yeah, no, I uh, no, I. Eileen asked me to be on here Wait tonight. So. Oh, okay. Because um, there was nobody listed on that on the sheet. Oh, so she probably took her off. Maybe I don't know. She probably took her off, and I just didn't see the updated, updated, updated oh. version. Uh, it, yeah. it only happened yesterday. So ah. That's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> um. Okay. Let me just see. Uh, what time is it so far? We're just here, but that's okay. Ugh, it'll just be us. We'll have a good time. Uh, when are we broadcasting? We're not yeah. broadcasting. Yeah, we are. Oh, we, oh, we are. Yeah, but it's just us. I didn't know that. 
It's okay. It's it's just us. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I, I I will let you know if somebody else comes on. Oh, hi, <laughs> welcome to our meeting tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to get started at exactly seven thirty. So, uh, just a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, please put them into the question and answer on the Hoover app. I welcome some more people joining us. And I forgot to change my name. <laughs> so everybody thinks, everybody thinks my name is track two. <laughs> I wish it would remember that. Every yeah. single time we're like changing our name. I know, right? I'm going to start calling myself track two. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Did one in French this afternoon. That was a lot of fun. Not oh, yes. a word. Yes, but Romaine. Yes. All, 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 I can't say it now. I said it perfectly this afternoon. Oldenvelt. From yeah. Oldervelt. No. Oldervelt. He said yeah. I said it perfectly. <laughs> I, did, I, I did one in French yesterday, and I actually could pretty much understand the cue. He didn't say next in English. He ah. just <laughs> But I could tell when... We got. To, I was like, I, I actually understand more more French than I realized. Wow. Well, I, I understand absolutely nothing in French except for we. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another minute, and then we will go live. Okay, hi, good evening. I am Susan Leshin, and I am the Senior Director of Patient Programs and Volunteers for the Marfan Foundation, the VEDS, and the LDSF. I also want to introduce you to my colleague tonight, Josephine Grima, who is the Science Officer, Chief Science Officer for the Foundation, and she will be posting in the chat box during the session. Welcome to the third and final week of the International E3 Summit educating, empowering, and enriching our community. Brought to you by the Marfan Foundation and its divisions, the Lois Dietz Syndrome Foundation, and the VEDS movement, and our partner in Europe at Mercern. We wanna thank you for making this summit truly historical. It is by far the foundation's largest event with nearly 2,800 reg registrants from more than 72 countries. We hope you've had an opportunity to connect with people from all over the world on the Hoover app and that you can maintain these connections after the summit. As you surely know now, you are not alone on this journey. We are very grateful to our presenting sponsors, Brigham and Women's Hospital and American Commun Communications Construction. Before we start the presentation, I wanna let you know that the International E3 Summit is a forum to provide an open discussion of issues related to genetic aorta and vascular conditions. Opinions stated in each of the talks are those of the speakers and not necessarily those of the Marfan Foundation 
or Vasern. If you hear differences of opinion from speakers and want further clarification, please contact our help center at marfan.org backslash E3 ask. Be patient as the volume of emails and calls are very high during the summit. Today, we are very fortunate to have Kathleen Kane and John Rodas with us to talk about medical insurance and disability. I also want, before we move on to the presentation, I also would like you to remind you to give us your feedback when the session is over. You can start right here in the session on the app, click on rate, then answer the survey questions. Your feedback helps us to continue to provide information that is important to you. In addition to the session feedback, we encourage all E3 participants to complete the E3 Summit survey. Whether you attended one or all 70, your input is invaluable to helping us build future programs and services that meet your needs. To show our appreciation for your responses, three E3 Summit survey submissions will be selected at random to win a $50 USD paid, prepaid international debit card. Don't wait to submit yours. Only survey submitted by 11 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, this September 16th, will be eligible for the drawing. The survey can be accessed at marfan.org backslash E3 survey or by clicking the link on the E3 Summit homepage. And now we will begin our program for this evening. One second, I just have to, ah, where did it go? Um, Welcome everyone to Applying for Disability, presentation by myself, Jonathan Rodas, and my wife, Kathleen. And we're gonna be discussing a lot of different elements about disability, and this doesn't just pertain to the United States, mostly it does, but there are gonna be elements that are gonna be something you could use in your country, but especially with dealing with your doctors, improving your case, and getting better, better care in your, where you live. So the first thing we wanna talk about is the difference between the types of Social Security Disability. One is Social Security Disability, SSDI, and with that, you have to be able to have earned sufficient work credits to be insured under the program. So basically, you had to have worked and made enough money while you were working to, to be insured, and that's something that's, uh, you know, a formula that SS, the Social Security Administration determines. Um, this is the same pool of money for the Retirement Social Security Program. Supplemental security income is for people that have, probably have not worked and also for children. And the problem with this is you have to determine or they have to determine that you have financial need. So you have to have limited income and resources. And for a child, that would mean the household income and resources. For a child, if you have parents that work, you're probably not gonna be eligible, at least until the child is 18 years old. Because the amount is very low, it's like either 1,200 or 1,100 a month, which is something that's extremely hard, of course, to live on. Which is something I've told people to please help advocate the legislature to change and the social security system to change. So the first thing um, is making a decision to file, and again, this can be a, you know a difficult one, and I think John can speak to this since he was in that position before. Yeah, health considerations, of course, is the paramount. Uh, for me, I think I had waited too long. I, I probably worked 11 years more than I should have, but because I wanted to keep my career and I worked very hard for it. But who knows what kind of damage I did to my health doing that. So for all of you out there that are considering it, you definitely have to consider what am I doing to my health? And then it will lead, of course, into the financial considerations, which are many. Because it's, it's not, you know, you need to survive. So it's, that's another aspect of this. It's very difficult for people. So it's important to know what your local resources are, what assistance you have, and to make sure that the process, that you can do the best process possible so you can get approved quicker. And of course, the, the next thing on that, uh, uh, that ties into that are the emotional considerations, which um, goes, which is very difficult. I even to this day deal, uh, deal with a lot of emotional issues 
was not able to ability to work. But that's that's understandable. But what's most important is realizing that your life is not over. It's actually just beginning in another way. So, you know, there's a lot of positives that can come out of it. I mean, look at the work I do. So. So when you initially decide to uh, apply, you can do it one of two ways. You can do it online or you can do it in person. Um, for online, you can go to www.ssa.gov and there'll be a link uh, that says disability. Um, whichever way you do, you want to have all of your medical information um, and all of your, your work history available because either way, you're going to have to have that information in order to uh, start the initial process. Maybe John can speak to his experience with applying in person. Yeah, well, many people have heard this through other presentations on the Empowerment Series through the Marfin Foundation and other organizations that we've spoken at or uh, for in, in the presentations. But when I filed, I figured I would go in personally because I was this people person and I thought that made the most sense. And this is back in 2001. And when I went in and, and you know, you realized by what I said earlier, all the considerations I had to deal with and the fact I was losing my career. Uh, when I walked in the door, the, the gentleman at Social Security asked me, you're disabled? And uh, that really threw me for a loop. I almost, like I've said uh, in the past, I felt like punching him because the last thing I wanted to do was file for disability, but the problem was he didn't understand what an invisible disability is. And a lot of us have this invisible disability. You can't see it, but we have a hurricane inside of us. It's causing all kinds of problems. So I, instead of punching him and knocking him over the table, I said to him, sir, let me just tell you part of my disability to you. Think about the last time you had a bad cold. You ached all over, you were very weak, you felt like crap. You probably didn't want to go to work at school or whatever you were doing that day. You forced yourself into it. I said, I feel like that two to three days a week. I gave him a chance to think about it. And then I said to him, now think about the last time you had a bad flu and how low your energy was, you ached all over. Just getting out of bed to go to the bathroom was an effort. I said, that's how I feel four to five days a week. And at that, he, he, his face turned totally red and he said, please sit down. And he was nice to me all the way through and he actually thanked me at the end for explaining what invisible disability is. So I would say really, if you can do it online, it'd be a lot easier, but you, it's your preference, it's your choice. So there's several um, levels once you've applied and we'll talk about that a little later, but. Uh, John and I, when we went through this, put some things together that we thought might help for somebody who is, you know, filing initially that hopefully maybe get them approved sooner rather than later. So, you want to talk about that? Yeah, when you're filing, filing either form, SSI or SSDI, of course, you, you know, you want to answer the question, but you also want to be able to put anything that has to do with a limitation that goes with that question and the answer, because it is really important to have this listed to understand limitation itself. Um, and when you file, you know, make sure you have the information, like Kathy said, handy. So you can look at maybe your medical records or maybe even list some of your limitations so you have it all set. Or, or if you have an advocate you're working with, um, like what I do is I, I, I already set up something when I'm, when I'm helping someone. So they already have that information that they can utilize when they're filing their forms. Um, Another part of this is state funding programs or wherever you live, there may be financial assistance programs that you may not be aware of or assistance programs. It's always worth checking out where you live, no matter where in the country or, or what country you live in, see if there's any kind of support mechanism for you. Um, support letter, Kathy, you want to talk about the support letter? Well, that's from the, the marketing. Yeah, oh, yes. Okay. Well, I thought maybe you want to talk on the legal side, but the support letter uh, is a letter that uh, the Marfan Foundation writes. Uh, if you contact them, usually it's through, they, it comes, I'm sorry, people who come to me sent to me by Jan Lynch, uh, and Jan sends me, sends me people that need uh, help. I go over their case, and then if, at, at, the, the, um, at the first denial, that's when you want a support letter from the foundation, and it's very powerful. So if you have Marfan's ehlers Danlos Syndrome, you know, low deep syndrome, sticklers, it would be very helpful for your case. Um, condition research is really important as well, uh, as far as anything that relates to a, a limitation that you have. 
Why I say that is because if you submit something that has nothing to do with the limitation you have, it's not going to help your case. So you need to provide information regarding something that you are limited with, and that, uh, that can help just bolster uh, why you have a limitation or what is the limitation. You can't take it for granted that Social Security knows your condition or comorbid, comorbid condition because so nine times out of ten they don't. A doctor's evaluation is extremely important and a doctor's support is extremely important because they are the ones that put the information in the record and I can't stress this enough. Wherever you live, no matter where you live in the world, getting your doctors on your side, you have to explain what you live with each day, each moment, and give them in terms like I did, like a cold or a flu or, uh, you know, like what, uh, a toothache to describe some of your pain throughout your body. You want your doctors to understand what you live with. And that's not their fault that they don't. It's that they haven't had, we haven't had the tools to say the right things. And that's something I just learned myself. And it really has helped with my care, not just with through disability, but my future, my present care and my future care, and it will help you with yours. Um, your medical records, it's really important to look at your medical records to see what's in their medical records. If there's anything written in there that is not true, you have a right to contact the source, hospital, or whoever, whoever produced these records to say, this is not correct. They'll probably provide you a form. Please fill it out because the agency, Social Security in America, SSA, they're going to look at anything that's in the record to utilize, unfortunately, against you. Um, it also helps if you have or know someone that's been approved for your condition in your state uh, for a lot of reasons, because they can be uh, supportive, um, but it's, it's not a bad idea. And you can probably find that through your local support group, which is a whole other, you can do a whole other presentation of why local support groups are so important. You can find some of your best support as far as uh, local care recommendations, uh, things to avoid, things like that. And the last uh, piece, uh, doing a daily journal, this is something my wife had asked me to do when I filed, and I thought she was going to have me keep a diary, and I thought, no, I'm not going to keep a diary. She said, no, no, it's a journal. Just list out, basically, things that happen during the day. So talk about my day. So I would talk about, like, I'm walking down the hall and I walk into the door, or uh, I couldn't shower that day because I don't have enough energy, um, or um, I got up and I was busy and I fell backwards or I had to go to the emergency room for whatever reason I had to go. These are important things because it lists the day-to-day -day of what you're living with. It's kind of a record of it. Whether a judge reads it or not, all depends upon the judge. So at the initial phase, there's something called the listing of impairments, okay? And this is something that if you are, if you're disorder or disease falls under the listing of impairment, then you will be approved, you know, probably in the, the first round, so to speak. Um, Varkin syndrome is in the listing of impairments, okay, however, um, it's probably not as effective as we would like to have it, although the Marken Foundation did work with Social Security years ago to have it kind of better defined, you know, speak that yeah, and I, I actually helped with that as well. But we, me and another gentleman wrote testimonials about what we deal with and, and some other things. And, um, uh, you know, the foundation did a wonderful job getting this addressed. But Kathy's right, you know, at least this is listed. That helps. It talks about the, the limitations, as you can see on the screen. Now, for those of you who have Lois Dietz, uh, Sticklers, and Ellis Danlos, and Vascular Ellis Danlos, it's um, something that definitely we should consider working on uh, together to try to make uh, uh, get that into the listing. So the single listing is just it can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, these other disorders that we, we spoke of are not in the listing of impairments. However, if something is not in the listing of impairments, that doesn't mean that you still can't be deemed disabled. The next step would be to the Social Security Administration to evaluate your residual functional capacity, which as we have there is basically taking into consideration all of your impairments, okay, the severe ones and the not severe ones, what are you left that you can do in terms of work? Um, so 
I've represented hundreds of people with connective tissue disorders, and you know, 95% were approved because of in the analysis under the residual functional capacity. So basically, um, we're going to start the administrative hearing is actually the, the last step. Um, so we'll talk about that in a second. Stages of appeal. You apply first and you have probably uh, an answer for that in three or four months. Sometimes it's longer. Okay, most people are denied again if you don't go into the listing of impairment category. Um, and then normally what you do is get oh, always almost yes, <clears throat> is a snotty letter from the government and Kathleen told me it was going to come, and I still got angry because it's it's it's, it is, it's not it basically tells you well we considered what you sent or what you done but we feel it still you can work and that's when you appeal. Yeah, the next stage is called reconsideration, and that's basically just someone else in Social Security looking at your case and evaluating your case. Um, so again, most people are going to be denied a reconsideration as well. And that's probably another three or four months. Um, at that point, you appeal and you ask for a hearing in front of an administrative law judge, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, you can wait up to a year and sometimes longer for a hearing in front of the judge. Depends on where you are um, in the United States, but it is a lengthy wait. If you are unsuccessful at the hearing, you can go to the Appeals Council, and the Appeals Council actually looks at what the judges did at the hearing. They can, the Appeals Council can remand or, or overturn the judge's decision. But it's difficult, just like any other appeal in the legal field. Um, the Appeals Council decisions are, are difficult to, to have be successful, basically. Um, after that, you can actually go into the United States District Court. Um, you can go to the Appeals Court after that, and you can go to the Supreme Court. Obviously, um, there's not a good chance that you're going to be successful at those levels, unless it is an issue that's very nuanced and very but more of a legal issue as opposed to a factual issue. It's going to be difficult to win at those levels. What is what what has become more of a factor? And I can't be political because I'm a an advocate, a medical and disability advocate, so I can't be political. But unfortunately, I've seen a rise the last four to five years of uh, people being turned down at a hearing, uh, losing uh, a decision which they more than likely should have won based on the judge's low approval rate. Low approval rate. I mean, if you can check on a judge beforehand and their approval rate's like, what, 25%, that's a very, very low rate of approval. Uh, so there's, there's, always, there's always that aspect of, you know, should I go forward or get another judge? You know, what should I do? But that's something I want people to understand because there's no slam dunk when it comes to getting approved. Um, myself, as an advocate, I can prepare you as best as, as I possibly can, but I cannot control what the judge is going to do. Yeah, and we'll talk about the hearing in a second, but John, what you're saying is very true. Um, I've been doing this type of work for a long time and progressively over the years, I mean, it's become more and more difficult. Just as a, for instance, you know, five, seven years ago, if you went to an administrative hearing, um, overall, nationally, 70% of people were approved. Now the number is more like below 50%, okay? And as John mentioned, sometimes you get judges that are you know, twenty percent approval rating, which is which is ridiculous. But it's the system that we have to work with, but which is very, you know, it's why you you have to be prepared and you have to just do everything correctly um, to get the approval. The administrative hearing is the most important step in this because you're actually in front of a judge. Okay, um, you get to advocate for yourself. Um, if you have an attorney, the, the attorney obviously is going to be advocating for you, and you know you really get to, to try to explain to the judge what your limitations are. And in these cases, again, it's all about what the limitations are and how they add up such that you can't work. Preparation, obviously, is very, very important. Um, John mentioned in the beginning about doing research. I, when I um, represent people at administrative hearings, I always make sure that I have um, medical articles about you know, what their disorder is so that the judge realizes the implications of this. Um, witnesses, you can have witnesses, 
I always tell people that um, it depends on the judge. Some judges just get really, not really happy when you have judges or witnesses that are kind of biased, you know, for instance, your husband or a mother or something like that. But you do have the right to have witnesses. Um, if you have, if I have a client that I think can, you know, pretty well advocate for themselves, I don't think I need witnesses. But if that's not the case, sometimes it is important to have someone who, you know, lives with you and knows what you go through as a witness. They can have medical experts. Um, the medical experts are paid by the Social Security Administration to, um, to be there to testify. However, they're you know, supposed to be independent. Medical experts don't really um, appear at hearings very much, okay? And I mean, truthfully, when they do, the medical expert is usually not an expert in what your disorder right. is. They're more like a primary care I mean, a physician. Um, so, you know, I, I never have a problem having a medical expert at a hearing because, you know, I, I've been going to conferences for 15 years, so I, I you know, I, I feel like I can adequately cross-examine a medical expert about Marfan syndrome or vascular EBS or Rosette Street syndrome. Kathy actually looks forward to that because she's right. There's no, they're not experts in the conditions that you have. Just like when you were, uh, and I don't know if they do this in other countries, but they can get a doctor to review you before they make a decision. Uh, those doctors normally have no, very little experience of any of your condition. But with those type of appointments, it's important to walk in there with basically what your limitations are and paramount that your doctors understand your limitations and they've documented it. And the, the residual functional capacity forms or the, any forms I know in your country, what they're called, but something, a support letter from the doctor, forms filled out that will greatly help you. Yeah, one of the things I'm always asked or um, commented to about is um, a person's doctor. So again, it, like John said, it's imperative, imperative that you have a doctor that's supportive. Some people will come to me and say, my doctor is not comfortable in writing a letter saying that I'm disabled. My answer is that's fine because according to the Social Security Administration, it is not a doctor's job to determine you're disabled. Okay? What a doctor can do is explain what your, your limitations are. So I actually have forms that I use that are specific to that. How, you know, how long can you sit in a day? How long can you stand in a day? Um, you know, do you have other kind of, you know, what's your ability to concentrate or focus? What's your pain level? And is that pain level going to interfere with your ability to, to focus and concentrate during a work day? Um, and by the way, a work day is um, eight hours a day, a work week, obviously 40. You get a 15 minute break in the morning, a half hour for lunch, and a 15 minute break in the afternoon. Other than that, you're supposed to be what we refer to in, in this world is on task. So you're supposed to be concentrating and focusing on whatever it is that you're there to do. And if you're not, you're probably not going to be employable. And if you miss two or three days a month, you know, maybe four, you're not employable either. And, you know, they, the experts at this administrative hearing would say that. Vocational experts are there to tell the judge if there are jo uh, jobs that you can um, actually do in the national economy. And the judge, what he does is ask what we call a hypothetical question. So he asks the vocational expert, if you have a person of this claimant's age, work experience, with the following limitations, what jobs would they be able to perform in the local and the national economy? And um, the attorney, if you have an attorney, is able to cross-examine the vocational expert. And you know, basically, the attorney's job at that point is to get it down to the point where the vocational expert would say, no, there is no job that this person can perform. Another couple things to add just real fast to the what you can and cannot do. A lot of times people forget to mention that if, they, if you have GI issues or you have to go to the bathroom a lot, employers aren't going to want you getting up six, seven, eight times a day from your area to go to the bathroom. Um, these are things that are, you, you know, you need, the doctors need to know. Uh, in addition to the pain, the fatigue, you know, dizziness, any of the other issues that you have, uh, if you have existing aneurysms or there's a whole bunch of different things, but they should be aware of everything. You should make them aware. Don't assume they know something. Let them know in a nice, respectful way. So 
Um, just a couple more comments. Um, actually, I did want to comment about medical insurance as well. Um, we can talk more about that in, in terms of a question and answer when we go to the question and answer period. But I guess the, the bottom line with medical insurance, as far as I'm concerned, is appeal, appeal, appeal. Okay, so you have to fight your insurance companies, obviously, sometimes to get tests or to get surgeries approved. And um, you know, the doctor obviously can help with that. But I think it's just a matter of appeal, appeal, appeal. And I, I believe Montana Foundation, Jan Lynch, can also help with that. She can. And I can also help as well because I've, I've overturned a lot of decisions as far as insurance. And how I do it is basically showing the necessity. So Jan can do that as well. She can write a letter of necessity. So if they're trying to turn you down for something that you need because of your condition, that it's a requirement, it's not like cosmetic, it's when Jan could write something. I also can help and give you guidance as to what to write or what to say. Uh, but that's really important because that's happening more and more, just as is unfortunately people getting letters of, well, we don't think you're disabled anymore. But everyone so far in the last two years that has done that, I've actually had them overturned because basically how I've done that, and I'll share that with you, I don't want to, nothing's a secret here, uh, is that you get your doctors to write something basically stating you haven't improved since you filed a disability, actually you, you, would, you probably degenerated. And that normally turns the key. Anything else, Kathy, that you can think of? No, just um, something about medical records. When in the initial phase, you're going to have to tell the Social Security Administration, all of your providers, all of your hospitalizations, all of your medication. And what they're supposed to do is actually they're supposed to order the records. Um, what I found is a lot of times they don't get all of your records and they don't get records that could help you. So what I tell people now is get your own records. First of all, as John said, you can actually go through them and see if there's anything that is a problem, okay, and either know how to deal with the problem or there's a procedure where you could actually put an amendment into it with, um, with your issues about what they're saying. Um, so if it was me, I would get all of my medical records in the beginning. Yeah. Also, also, you never know, which unfortunately does happen. You might see a result of something and it was never told to you. That's kind of frightening, but it can't happen. So it's good to read everything that's in the report. Um, and then I want to say something as far as, uh, I'm not sure how much time we're going to have, but uh, building a medical team is essential, and not just for disability, but medical and disability is interwoven. So if you want to get good care and good support, try to build a medical team and have them speak to one another. Hopefully it would be within the same institution. It's difficult, more difficult if you're, out, if you're from two or three different institutions. But if you have no choice, then there are some ways to, make, to improve that. But I can't stress that enough because my care has gotten a lot better since I have now a medical team at one hospital. Okay, I think that's all we have. Glad to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Kathleen and John. Um, we do have some questions and I just want to pin you to the center, okay. Um, is it best to get a lawyer when you apply for SSDA or can you do it yourself? So in the beginning, it's not necessary to get a lawyer. Um, however, two things, you should be able to be prepared to advocate for yourself and to, you know, look at that checklist that we went through. And, you know, that's, I think, some of the things that you need to do in the beginning. Um, John also is an advocate who helps people in the beginning of the process. So we can speak to that a little. Yeah, um, I actually help people through the whole process, even if they did get a lawyer or they did get an advocate uh, because of my experience. Um, but I normally tell people not to hire a lawyer up front. And, and you know, like if somebody want to hire Kathy, not a, I don't, she, she would tell them, wait until the reconsideration stage. Or until you have to go in front of a judge. That's yeah. in front of a judge. Yeah. Because the attorneys, and I, and I have an attorney right next to me, you don't have, they don't have to do much work up to that point. And if I were to get you approved or an advocate were able to get you, well, an advocate charges, I don't charge. But if you'll get approved at that point, all the money goes to you. So, you know, the only time I would ever say get a lawyer up front is if let's say you had no one, you, you didn't have the capacity to do the forms yourself 
or you had no one to help you, or you had issues, mental issues as far as memory, and uh, then you would need someone to, to help you. That's, that's, that's the exception. And just as an aside, the way that lawyers in Social Security charge for their services is that they're not allowed, allowed to charge by the hour or anything like that. They get 25% of your retroactive benefits if you are approved, okay? If you're not approved, you're not gonna get any retroactive benefits. They won't get paid uh, because you're not gonna get your, any, you know, they, it's only based on retroactive benefits. It's a contingent situation. I know, and I know a lot of people worry about the cost. Well, the cost isn't really anything because they don't, if, if, if they don't win, they don't get paid. And then of course you don't get, you get, you get your money, but you're not gonna have to put anything up front Right, unless there's some Correct. arbitrary small fee. Yeah. Okay, hey, great. Thank you. Um, is morphins considered a disability in Canada? Can we apply for disability or additional health coverage in Canada? So, um, you know, obviously I practice in the United States, but I did do a little research into Canada, and I think there was also questions about Germany. And basically, in Canada, there is not the listing of impairments that we spoke about in our presentation. So what they have is basically the wording is, it's not the diagnosis alone, but it's the impact of your medical condition on your ability to work, which is basically what our residual functional capacity is that we spoke about in the presentation. And from what I could tell of Germany, it's I think the same standard, although probably most of the important information on Germany was in German, so <laughs> I wouldn't be able to. You should learn German. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think also to say is that, you you know, with, with the uh, diagnosis, having a diagnosis of DDS vascular or, or hypermobility or Marfan or Lewis disease, that doesn't, that doesn't get you disability. But what it does is it, the limitations of that condition or the severity, better said, severity of the condition that you have can greatly help you. Okay, great. Um, what are some disadvantages to think about when considering ap applying for disability? One that comes to mind is the ability to get good health medical coverage. Anything else? Trying to weigh some pros and cons on this. So um, in terms of medical insurance, um, it's actually a, an advantage to have to be, you know, on disability. If you have um, disability under SSDI, you are eligible for Medicare, okay, which you know, obviously is a good program. If you're on SSI, then you're eligible for Medicaid, um, which depending on your what state you're in can also be, you know, quite a good program. Um, there are other considerations that I think we talked about in our presentation in terms of, you know, losing your, you know, your job, you know, your financial considerations, emotional considerations. I think they're more important than you know, and, the, the medical insurance. Yeah, and making your health worse, like I did. I know I did. My 11 years, I probably should have filed sooner, and I definitely did damage. So that's a huge one you have to think about. So there really aren't that many, um, you know, breakdowns as far as that go, other than financial. I mean, waiting to get approved, it's not easy. It's not, a, it doesn't happen quickly unless you actually meet the severity of the list. Yeah, I mean, I think the financial considerations are huge. Um, you're basically, you can't be working and apply. So you, you stop working, you have no income, and it could be for a year and a half to two years that you have no income. So obviously that's an important consideration for most of us. Isn't there like a little leeway though, if they work part-time and they only make up to a certain amount? Yeah, you can, you can work. Basically, you can have what they refer to as substantial gainful employment. Um, substantial gainful activity, which is basically, it changes every year, but it's about $1,100. So you can't make more than $1,100 a month, or you're not going to be dis deemed disabled. Because you, you, know, you have to survive, you have to pay some bills, and not that $1,100 is a lot of money a month, because it certainly isn't. Okay, okay. Well, you answered the, one of the next questions at the same time, so that was perfect. I'm a mind reader. <laughs> yeah, really, that was pretty good. Um, how can we work together to get vascular Ellis downloads and other related conditions on the listing? Well, I think, I think Josephine Grimm will be the perfect person to answer that question because she did a lot of the work to get it listed. Um, you really have to basically wrap a lot of information, go in front of hearings, Social Security's hearings, um, and then do what Josephine did and make the case that there's a substantial limitation in the condition 
So it's, it's a process, but it's a process that, and, I, and I, like I said, I was part of that, that process and I'd love to help get all of the conditions listed, sticklers, vascular, the whole mm -hmm. works, It'd be wonderful because they are limiting. They yes. are disabling. Yeah. I will tell you that I have represented about three or four people with uh, vascular EDS. And I think in each case, um, they were approved, of course, but at the end of the hearing, the judge said something to the effect of, I can't believe you weren't approved right away. So, you know, whatever, for whatever that's worth. I mean, obviously it's a, a you know, it's severe disorder. So the sooner the better in terms of, you know, being able to be approved. Right, absolutely. Just, just so you know, we I have contacts that we worked with before, and we can certainly look into that for these other related disorders. Because as from our fan, it was just it's just not even mentioned in the, the listing of impairments. So, well, you did a great job, Josephine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, if an individual retires from a job with a pension at age sixty. Can they still apply for Social Security Disability? Um, yeah, I guess the question there would be as long as you have enough um, insured credits, okay, you would be able to uh, apply for disability um, because basically disability will take you to your full retirement age. So you could be on disability from 60 till your full retirement age of you know, 66 or whatever it happens to be. Um, so you could get benefits during that period of time. And then once you hit your full retirement age, they turn into retirement benefits. Okay. That's very good. That's good to know. Um, uh, this one, hopefully you'll know, but uh, my daughter recently had applied for Medi-Cal after having PPO insurance for 35 years. What options do we have if an HMO won't cover her medications or will disagree with medical checkups that they seem that they deem unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Medical to California insurance. Right. Um, so could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Susan? Sure. Um, my daughter recently had to apply for Medi-Cal after having a PPO insurance for 35 years. Uh, she wants to know what options she has if the HMO decides that they won't pay for a medication or a checkup. Yeah, you know what, you know what the answer is would be uh, every state of this country as an insurance commissioner's office, give them a call, ask the question, they should be able to answer that. Yeah, um, states vary, you know, obviously tremendously in terms of their, their medical coverage. So it's very, very state specific. So, you know, we don't live in California, but John's right, the insurance commission would definitely be able to, to try to help with that. And also uh, your local state representative, and that's mm -hmm. a really key thing that can help you in a lot of areas so people wherever you live that politician's office is important to have a contact there and they can help and they can probably answer that too but i would say the insurance commissioner first and then the rep and uh, just i would also say make sure that you advocate with the insurance company provide them information on that you can get from our website that says that these things are necessary in order to treat um this disorder good point Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Uh, next question. Before I had surgery for Marfan, I was able to get life insurance. Now that I've had life prolonging surgery, I'm no longer insurable. Can the foundation put out a statement docu documenting Marfan patients who have had roof replacement surgery can have a normal lifespan? That's interesting. Might be a yeah. question for Josephine too. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Josephine could probably answer that. Let me hear the question again. Um, basically, what she's saying is uh, that before she had her surgery, her root surgery, she yeah. was able to get um, life insurance. And now that she's had it, she can no longer get um, insurance because they're saying she's not insurable. And I've also ha met with a lot of clients who've had this problem. I guess my question would be, did she get genetic testing? Because sometimes when you get genetic testing, um, after you get genetic testing, you can't get disability insurance, uh, long-term disability insurance, or possibly life insurance. Uh -huh. And so with genetic testing, you should 
always, uh, and your, your doctors or whoever is doing the testing should counsel you on that to make sure that um, if you want to get that insurance, you do it before the genetic test. So I don't know if usually a heart surgery wouldn't prompt somebody not to get um, life insurance. Um, I, I, I don't believe so, but they do take into consideration your health, um, but you actually you are more healthy now that you got your your surgery done. So I would assume yeah. that yeah. you are more eligible than you right. were previously. So yeah. But another interesting factor is like for myself, I had heart surgery and of course I'm disabled. <clears throat> I can still get life insurance, but a very minimal amount. So companies like uh, United, United of Omaha, things like that, they offer life insurance policy to people who have pre-existing conditions. So, but they're men, they're smaller. They're not hundred thousand dollar policies. That's another thing you can check into the companies. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, any hints specific to appealing a short-term disability insurance claim that was denied? I think you covered a lot of that. I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah. It, you know, at that point, it's all about your doctor. Really, you have to have the support of your doctor, and because um, the doctor is completing forms, and you know he has to be on board with this. Okay. Um, okay, this, uh, is it more difficult to apply for disability when you have a VUS in the TGFBR1 gene? These are high markers throughout the family for have aortic aneurysms. It's certainly not more difficult. Um, again, it's never really about the, with disability that, um, condition or the genetic marker or anything like that. It's, it's about what your limitations are, okay? The only time I, I've actually seen um, genetics come into the picture is with Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility because there is no genetic marker. And basically I've had judges say, well, there's, no, there's nothing saying that they have EDS when actually they have a clinical diagnosis of EDS, but it's just not a genetic marker to recognize that at this point. So, but right. that, that would not be a problem. So it all comes down to, like Kathy said, limitations is really right. the key. Not about diagnosis as much. Right. Um, any six suggestions in having successful periodic SSD reviews after having received benefits for 10 years? Um, she's seeing their docs and psychologists resulted in them overturning her case. It was eventually resolved in her favor, but it, she thinks, feels it'll happen again. It all will come down to is the doctor's uh, report and the doctor yeah. filling out the form saying they haven't improved, they've actually stayed the same or gotten worse. So it would be back on Social Security to prove otherwise. Yeah, and two, two things about this. First of all, um, John and I have seen a lot of these reviews more so than we, we've ever seen uh, lately. So, you know, this thing does happen, especially when you're younger, okay, They're, they are going to have the periodic reviews. Um, number two, John's absolutely right about your doctors, but what I've seen sometimes is people after they get disability maybe aren't seeing their doctors as much. You know, a lot of times with these conditions, it's just a matter of you know, sort of ma maintaining as opposed to seeking out new treatment. So you, you always have to remember that there, this is something that could come up and you want to make sure that you're continually seeing your doctors and the doctors are continuing to document what your limitations are. That's a great point. And I know sometimes even with the, when you're on disability, you're limited by financially, but having at least one core doctor to support you is really important. Okay. Um, uh, Josephine, were there any questions in the chat box? Say that again, Susan? I'm sorry, were there any questions in the chat box or any additional questions? That was all I had. No, that was okay. it. Okay, okay. Um, thank you so much. We just have a few more Oops. thoughts. Um, some final thoughts. Um, if your question was not answered here, please submit it to us through our website, marfan.org backslash E3ask. Please be patient as the volume of questions is very high during the summit. Also, we'd very much like to have your feedback. 
uh, please do the session survey um, that is in the app that I showed you before. Um, your, your feedback is incredibly important to us. And we also have, oops, sorry, there it is, I'm sorry. Um, oh, I think I spoke about that already, I'm sorry. Um, if you would like to um, put anything online with a hashtag, uh, E3 Summit 20, uh, please continue connecting with the community on the Hoover app. That'll be open for uh, quite a long time and you'll have uh, access to it. Um, visit the exhibitors in our virtual exhibit hall if you haven't already done so. And if you'd like to see more programming um, like this or other programs, please consider making a donation to marfan.org backslash donate. Our next program that we are very excited about coming up, um, be, which begins on September 19th through the 26th, is our Aortic Disease Awareness Week. This is a worldwide event that is powered by the Marfan Foundation, and we hope you will all participate in our awareness project, raising your hands to raise awareness of the risk factors of aortic disease. Information is available in the Summit app, on our website, and in our social media. Um, John, Kathleen, do you have any last minute uh, thoughts you'd like to add? I don't have any my hand, but no. <laughs> thank you both very much for all you do. And uh, um, I hope everyone enjoyed the E3 Summit. I know there's another day left, but thank you. Okay, thank you both so much. And thank, thank you, you, Josephine. Everybody have a good night. You too, Dale. You too. Take care. Good night. Good night.